Welcome back Highlanders. We are about to begin our final ascent up the macroeconomic mountain. We just have one more base camp or two more chapters to cover. So in this next section, we're going to be talking about money in the banking system and introducing this idea of monetary policy. And then in our uh, 14th and final chapter, we're going to be talking about how monetary policy affects the economy. Once we get through that, you have reached the summit and uh, conquered this macroeconomic mountain that we've been climbing all quarter long. But before we get started on this section, I do want to kind of mention a uh, brief difference here between fiscal and monetary policy. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, exit the full screen mode so that we can use different colors. But both of these uh, policies are going to be used to stabilize the economy. And so I want to make sure, that, again, we understand this difference so that we know the difference between what we talked about in chapter 11 and 12 and then chapters uh, 13 and 14. So there's two different kinds of policies we can use to stabilize the economy. One is this fiscal policy. And this is what we've been talking about in the last two chapters. So this is going to be uh, chapters 11 and 12. And with regards to fiscal policy, this is something that is performed by the federal government. And there are two types of fiscal policy here. We have expansionary policy, again designed to heat the economy up out of a recession. So we have expansionary fiscal policy. And remember, that involves increasing government spending and or cutting taxes, both of which are going to lead to a budget deficit. And then we also have what is known as restrictive fiscal policy. And the idea behind restrictive fiscal policy is that we are going to lower government spending and raise taxes, and in doing so, hopefully create a budget surplus, or at least reduce the size of the deficit, depending on where that budget is when we start. And so that's kind of what we've been talking about in the last two chapters. Now, in the next two chapters, we're going to be focused on this idea of monetary policy, which can also be used to stabilize these economic fluctuations. Now, again, so this is what we're talking about here in chapters 13 and 14. And this is performed not by the federal government. This is actually performed by the central bank in the United States, known as the Federal Reserve, which a lot of people think is a government entity because it has that word federal in it. But this is actually, again, a kind of private organization. So it operates uh, independently of the government, although there is a lot of interaction between officials at the Federal Reserve and the leaders in our, uh, in our uh, federal government. And once again, there are two types of monetary policy that we can perform. The first being known as expansionary monetary policy. And expansionary policy, uh, monetary policy, involves the money supply going up. And we're going to talk about four ways in which the Fed conducts that monetary policy as part of this chapter. And then the other type of monetary policy that can be performed by the Federal Reserve is known as restrictive monetary policy. And that involves decreasing the money supply or making that money supply go down. 
So similar to fiscal policy, monetary policy is designed to hopefully correct the economy and bring us towards full employment. And if the economy is suffering a recession, the Fed might use expansionary monetary policy to help stimulate economic activity. However, one side effect of expansionary monetary policy is that it can lead to inflation, which we've talked about in Chapter 8, can be pretty damaging to an economy. So restrictive monetary policy is designed to restrain those inflationary booms or try to keep that uh, inflation in check. So again, monetary policy is performed by the Federal Reserve, whereas fiscal policy is performed by the federal government, which are two uh, separate entities. And so I just want to make sure that everybody has those different types of uh, stabilizing policy different in their heads before we go on and talk about this monetary policy. So again, we spent two chapters talking about fiscal policy. Let's now spend a couple chapters talking about this monetary policy. Starting, of course, with chapter 13 called Money, the Banking System, and Monetary Policy. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about the three functions of money, or the three functions for which a currency serves in our economy. And then we'll talk about the difference between the M1 and M2 definitions of money supply. We'll also talk a little bit about how banks create money uh, through this fractional reserve banking system. And then we're going to talk about the Federal Reserve System or the Central Bank in the United States and the four ways that that Fed controls the money supply. So that's where we're headed here in uh, Chapter 13. So starting off with the three functions of money, right? So we kind of grew up with a currency, so we're pretty familiar with it. But again, imagine if no such currency existed. So imagine that here in the United States, there weren't dollars, there weren't cents. There wasn't a, a currency that's used to buy things. You just traded goods for other goods. So if you're somebody who made hats for a living, you would trade your hats for your food, your dwelling, like your apartment, uh, maybe your um, clothing, right? Whatever you could trade your hats for. Right, so there's no money serving as an intermediary here as part of that exchange. Right? So you kind of imagine a world like that, and you'll wonder and you'll start to understand why these uh, three functions of money are really important for our economic prosperity. Let's start off with the first one is that money is used as a medium of exchange. And that means that it's used to buy goods and services. Right? And that's important, right? Because if you didn't have money to buy goods and services, then you could only trade the goods you produced for the goods that other people uh, were, uh, produced. And that's hard to make that trade happen, right? It's more efficient to use money than it is to barter goods for other goods, right? Uh, because usually money is pretty uh, accepted by everyone. And so everyone will take the uh, money that you are offering to buy their goods. And of course, you'll take the money that people are offering you when they're trying to buy your goods, right? So again, it's kind of a medium of exchange. And by the way, just so you all know, we are operating with what is known as fiat money. And fiat money is money that has no intrinsic value. So here in the United States, right, our money is no longer backed by the gold standard, not since 1971 and the collapse of the Bretton Woods system, right? So with that in mind, what makes your money valuable is just the fact that people perceive it as valuable, right? As soon as people stop perceiving it as valuable, it won't be valuable anymore. It's no longer backed by gold or any, uh, anything else that is considered substantial, right? It's just pieces of paper with dead president's pictures on them. But it has value because other people determine that it's valuable and are willing to exchange goods for it. So let's talk a little bit about this whole idea of a medium of exchange and why it's important, right? So with that in mind, I'm going to exit the full screen mode again. Um, I want you to imagine that you're living again in a world without money. So money doesn't exist, right? And you're walking along a road here. Let's say that you are an apple farmer. So here's you, you farm apples, that's what you do for a living. And you're thinking, you know, I have a lot of apples, but what I really need is some vitamin C to help prevent scurvy or any other kind of disease like that. I really want some oranges. So you have apples, but what you really want are those oranges. Now, in a world with money, that's an easy fix, right? You can sell your apples for money, and then you can take your money to whoever the apple or whoever the orange producer is and buy their oranges with it, right? But in a world without money, you have to meet somebody who's walking along that same road. Maybe it's a girl this time. Maybe not. I don't know. And that girl or whoever, that person, has to not only have oranges, but they also have to want your apples. 
And that is what is known as the double coincidence of wants. In a world without money, you have to find somebody who has what you want and who wants what you have. And that's a much harder thing to accomplish than just finding somebody who has what you want and then finding somebody else who wants what you have, right? So with that in mind, because um, money is something that is accepted by everybody, it kind of serves as this lubricant or medium of exchange that allows more transactions to happen. Again, you can sell your apples for money and take your money to buy oranges because, again, everybody kind of has money and wants money, right, in exchange for those goods or services, right? So in a world without money, it's a lot harder to engage in these voluntary exchanges that we know from Chapter 2 create a lot of value when they exist. So first function of money is it serves as that medium of exchange. Now, the second function of money that's uh, uh, equally, if not more important in terms of future growth, is that it serves as a store of value. Money is an asset that will allow people to transfer purchasing power from one period to the next. So imagine you're that orange grower who's walking along that road, and you have a really great year producing oranges, right? You have a really, uh, maybe it's good weather that year, or for whatever reason, right, you have this surplus of oranges, right? You can't keep those oranges into the next period in case you have a bad year selling oranges next year, right? It's not something that you can keep over time, right? Because oranges rot, right? They go bad, right? That's not necessarily the case with money. Now, if you could trade that surplus of oranges for some extra money and then save or invest that uh, extra money for a future year where maybe you won't be as profitable, then you're going to help smooth out not only your own consumption cycle, but maybe actually grow into the future, right? So again, money is something that will keep its value over time, this is provided, of course, that you do not exist or live in a world where that hyperinflation is going on. Like we talked about uh, post-World War I Germany or 2008 Zimbabwe, where money seemed to be losing its value by the day, right? That is a situation where the store of value function of money gets destroyed, right? So again, money is an asset that will allow people to transfer purchasing power from one period to the next, so long as that hyperinflation isn't present. Uh, it's important to note that money is also what's called a liquid asset, so it's an asset that can be easily and quickly converted to purchasing power. So in that next year, you can take that money and buy whatever you want with it, the same as you could this previous year. Again, as long as inflation isn't out of control, right, not only does the money keep its value, but it's something that you can easily and quickly turn into goods and services by uh, uh, buying them or trading your money for those goods and services. So again, money serves not only as a medium of exchange, but as a store of value. And thirdly, money serves as a unit of account, or it's a unit of measurement used by most people to post prices and keep track of revenues and costs and profits, right? So in other words, um, money is kind of a common denominator by which we use to kind of post prices and keep track of things. And that serves a more important function than you might immediately think, right? So I'm going to ask you a question that might be the hardest question to answer in all of this class. In a world without money, how much is an apple worth? Well... That's a hard thing to uh, answer, right? Someone might say, well, an apple might be worth another apple, and that's true, but that doesn't necessarily reveal any uh, information. If I were to as if I were going to offer a trade for your one apple, what would you trade for, right? In other words, would you trade, say, one orange? Maybe, but what if I don't have oranges? What if I have pears? How many pears is that apple worth? Is it worth two pears? It may be, but what if I don't have uh, pears? What if I have grapes? How many grapes is that apple worth? Is it worth, say, 20 grapes? I don't know, maybe. What if I don't have grapes? What if I have computers? How many computers is that apple worth? Is it worth, say... I don't know, 2,322 apples is uh, equal to one computer. I don't know, maybe, right? Again, these are all things that we'd have to kind of post in terms of posting the price of apples in terms of everything that could be traded for it, right? So that's kind of the idea here is that in a world without money, right, it'd be hard to know exactly how much an apple is worth relative to all these other goods and services. You'd have to post your pricing sheet as uh, maybe thousands of units long. Whereas in a world with money, it's a lot easier to solve that problem. You just post, hey, I'm selling my apples for, say, maybe 25 cents a piece. And then from there, we can kind of convert in our heads as easily as we want to how much uh, 25 cents could buy of these other goods and services, right? So, again, it's just a common denominator by which we can post prices and keep track of things. And that's an important function to have in an economy where, again, prices deliver information in a very important way. 
So those are the three functions of money. Make sure you understand those moving forward in the class. Again, it's important to have a currency by which we can buy goods and services, again, uh, save for the future and post prices in, rather than just having what we call barter exchange, where we exchange goods for other goods. So with that in mind, let's move forward and start talking about the different uh, definitions or calculations of the money supply. So the first one we're going to talk about is known as M1, and M1 is just the currency plus checkable deposits plus traveler's checks, right? And this is a kind of a one definition of the amount of money that's floating around in an economy. So currency is just cash and coins. So the amount of cash or change you have floating around uh, out there in the world is uh, counted in this M1 function of money supply or calculation of money supply. And then checkable deposits just refers to the amount of money that is in your checking account. All right, so whatever's in your checking account gets included into this M1 calculation of money. And then the other thing is something that not really as popular as it used to be, but what are known as traveler's checks. Right, traveler's checks are checks that you can use in uh, foreign countries, right? And you can kind of uh, trade those checks for goods and services the same way that you could write a check for, say, a good or service here in the United States from your checking account, right? So with that in mind, all these uh, three things have something in common, and that is that it, they're very liquid forms of money. So everything that goes in M1 is stuff that you can spend right away. In other words, you can go to the store with your cash and coins and buy stuff right away. You can go to the store with your checkbook or your uh, debit card, and you can go ahead and write a check or uh, swipe, swipe that debit card and buy stuff right away from your checking account. Right, or you can go overseas with your traveler's checks and again buy things right away in the stores with those traveler's checks. So you'll need to like convert it or switch it from one bank account to another right, in order to spend this. Right? All these are uh, pretty liquid and that you can spend directly from these accounts. And that's kind of what makes this the M1 function of money. So the other function or the other uh, calculation of money that we're going to talk about here is M2. And M2 includes everything in M1. So everything we just talked about in the last slide right so those cash and coins or that currency plus those checking accounts plus those travelers checks those are also into the m2 of uh, calculation of money as well right but it also includes things like your savings deposits so any savings accounts or any money that you have in your savings account Right, that would also be included into this M2 definition of money. Right, so a savings account is just any interest-bearing holding account at a bank. And the reason why this is an M2 and not into and not included into that M1 is because this is a less liquid form of money. Right, when you put money in your savings account, you can't directly spend money from that savings account. In other words, you can't go to the grocery store with your bank statement that has your money in your savings account in it and show it to the cashier in exchange for their uh, uh, goods and services that they're selling you. Right? What you can do is you can convert money from your savings account into your checking account. Right? You can do that very easily on, online now Right? is transfer money from one account to another. Right? As soon as you transfer it from your savings account into your checking account, right, then you have now increased the M1 money supply. You haven't changed the M2 money supply at all when you take money from your savings account and put it into your checking account. Again, you're just taking it from this source of M2 to this other source of M2. So M2 will stay the same, but M1 will go up when you switch money from your savings into your checking. Right. But in any case, you can't spend money directly from your savings account. Right. You have to first uh, switch it into either those cash or coins or the checking account or traveler's checks before you can spend it. The same thing is true of what we call small denomination time deposits. Right, or these are time deposits of less than a hundred thousand dollars. Right, and these are any financial accounts with a minimum time requirement, uh, usually referred to as a financial CD. So, like if you go to a bank and you say, I've got uh, maybe two or three thousand dollars that I'm not going to touch for a while, is there any way I can get a higher rate of return on it than from my savings account? A bank might point you towards a financial CD, say, Hey, here's an account that says if you leave your money in this account with us for two years, then we'll pay you, say, three percent interest instead of say a quarter of 1% interest. Now the catch is you do have to leave your money in that account for the uh, slotted amount of time. So if it's a three year CD, you have to leave it in there for three years. Um, if you try to take it out before then, you're gonna have to pay a huge penalty, right? So again, this is something that is far less liquid than what was included into that M1 definition. You can't spend money directly from your financial CD. 
you first have to take it out of that financial CD and put it into a different account, like a checking account or, uh, or convert it into cash before you can spend it. Right. And please notice that all it's only the small denomination time deposits or those of less than $100,000 that are included into M2. If it's more than $100,000, then that's something that gets included into what, we, what is known as M3, which we aren't going to talk about in this class, but you might talk about in, say, an intermediate macroeconomics class or economic classes in the future. And then the third thing that um, is included into this M2 definition up and above what is included into that M1 definition of money is what we call money market mutual funds. And this is uh, interest earning accounts that pull depositors funds and invest them in what we call highly liquid short term securities, also known often as bonds. Right. So basically it takes your, say, two or three thousand dollars and it pulls it with other people's two or three thousand dollars. So it has maybe, say, one hundred and fifty or two hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. And then it uses all that money to buy a large set of bonds. Right. Which you can then earn a red return off of. Right. So, again, this is something that isn't very liquid. Right. You can't spend directly from your mutual fund. You have to first sell your piece of the fund, take whatever money that that fund is worth and convert it into a checking account or into cash before you can go out there and buy stuff with it. Right. So, again, that's what separates M2 from M1 is M1 focuses on kind of that medium of exchange function of money in terms of it's the most liquid forms of money that you can buy stuff with right away. M2 focuses more of that store of account, or sorry, uh, store of value function of money, right? This is the idea that you can keep money over time without it's losing its value, right? So M2 is a much broader definition of money and it includes forms of money that are less liquid. Again, focuses on storing that money over time, right? So with that in mind, you might get a question like this on a quiz or exam. Economists who stress the store of value function of money generally is it argue that M1 is the best measure of the money supply. Well, as we just talked about, M1 focuses on the medium of exchange, not that store of value function of money. So with that in mind, they're probably going to prefer the M2 measure of the money supply to the M1 measure because M2 focuses on those features of, uh, or uh, parts of money that uh, is related to storing money over time or that store of value function. Right? Uh, they're probably not going to argue that M1 is a too broad of a definition given that it's the more narrow definition. And again, they're not going to prefer M1 to M2. Right? M2 is probably what they're going to prefer given that has those forms of money where you can keep its value over time. All right, so be able to answer a question like that on the quiz or exam. All right, moving forward, let's talk a little bit about the central bank. So a central bank is an institution that regulates the banking system and controls the money supply. Just about every country has a central bank that does this. So uh, you can think of a central bank as kind of the regulator of the bank for other banks. And it also uh, decides how big the money supply should be through this monetary policy that we're going to be talking about towards the end of this chapter. All right. So, again, the central bank in the United States is called the Federal Reserve System or often abbreviated as the Fed, which is kind of a misleading uh, name in that a lot of people think that this means that it is a government entity. But, again, it is not. It is a private entity that is sp supposed to operate separately from our government. Although, again, there tends to be a lot of interaction between leaders at the Fed as well as uh, along with uh, government officials. So leaders at the Fed uh, kind of suggest to government officials what should be done. And government officials often uh, talk to leaders of the Fed about what's happening. So there tends to be a lot of interplay between these two uh, um, entities. Now, one thing that the Fed does is it carries out regulatory policies, making sure that banks are following the rules. Right. There is a certain amount of uh, money that banks have to keep on hand at the bank and the Federal Reserve uh, System or the Fed is the group that makes sure that the bank is following the, those kinds of policies. And then the other thing that the Fed does is it conducts monetary policy or it expands the uh, money supply or restricts the money supply as it sees fit. Uh, again, if the economy is headed towards a recession or a uh, contraction, the Fed might use expansionary monetary policy to help stabilize that economy or keep that recession or contraction from being too bad, right? At the same time, this idea of injecting the uh, economy with money to prevent that re uh, recession could lead to inflation. So the Fed might later use restrictive monetary policy to keep that inflation in control or uh, in check, right? So I've got some pictures up here, right? Uh, this is uh, Ben Bernanke. He was the chairperson of the Fed, right, until uh, Jeanette Yellen was then uh, elected to be chairperson of the Fed, or I should say appointed, right, uh, to be chairperson of the Fed. And she is actually the first female ever chairperson who was appointed uh, to be the chairperson of the Fed. And then now uh, we have Jerome Powell. 
as our chairperson of the Federal Reserve, right, he's been the one uh, most recently appointed. So with that in mind, I mean, that's kind of who's in charge of this Federal Reserve system as its overarching head. But as we're going to talk about later, right, the policies carried out by the Federal Reserve system is actually going to be uh, from a collection of individuals, not just the chairperson, although that chairperson is involved. All right, so let's talk about a few definitions and then start talking about how banks create money. So the first definition we're going to talk about is what's known as bank reserves. And bank reserves includes the amount of money that the bank has on hand in their vaults or vault cash, plus the deposit that the banks have with the Fed or the Federal Reserve System. So if you're Bank of America, again, the Federal Reserve System is kind of like the bank for you, right? In the same way that you as an individual will have some money stored away in your, say, apartment or house or in your wallet or purse, but then you're going to have a lot of money also stored at, say, Bank of America, Bank of America is going to have money stored in its vault. That's kind of like the equivalent to the money you have stored in your wallet or your purse, right? But then the same way that you have money at Bank of America, Bank of America is going to have deposits with the Federal Reserve. So they're going to have money deposited at the Federal Reserve Bank. So again, think of the Federal Reserve as like the bank for your commercial banks. So the amount of money that Bank of America has in its vaults plus the amount of money that it has deposited with the Fed is the total amount of bank reserves that federal that uh, the Bank of America would have on hand right and in this country we engage in what is known as fractional reserve banking and this is a system that permits banks to hold reserves of less than a hundred percent against its depositors and what that means is that when you put money in say Bank of America Bank of America isn't just sitting on your money they're not just holding on to it if you put, say, $10,000 in Bank of America, they might hold on to a small amount of it, maybe like 20% or 2,000 of it, and then they're going to take the other $8,000 and they're going to lend it out, right? And the interest rate that they pay you for putting money in Bank of America is going to be a lot lower than the interest rate they're going to charge people for borrowing money from Bank of America, and that's how banks make money. They're essentially a middleman that uh, reduces the transaction cost between borrowers and lenders. Right, so when you put your money in Bank of America, you're the lender. The uh, Bank of America then takes your money and uh, loans it out to other people and charges them a higher interest rate than what they're paying you. And again, the difference between those interest rates are, is what the Bank of America is using to run their banks and uh, pay their employees and profit from, this, uh, from these transactions. So if you ever go back to Bank of America by yourself and say, I want all $10,000 my dollars back, Chances are Bank of America will have it because not only do they have 2,000 of your 10,000, but they got 2,000 of your neighbor's 10,000 and 2,000 of their neighbor's 10,000. So they have enough money to cover if any, say, one person wants their money back. As long as that one person isn't like a Bill Gates or a, um, a Jeff Bezos or somebody who's you know, incredibly rich and has enough money to maybe break the bank. Right? But if any one person wants their uh, money back, chances are the bank's going to have it. Right? Now, if everybody who has their money deposited at Bank of America wants all their money back at the same time, then chances are the bank's not going to have it. Because, again, their money's not sitting in the bank. Right? The money is being loaned out to other businesses or homes. Right? Whenever you borrow money for a mortgage loan or whenever you borrow money to go to school or whenever you borrow money to start a business, that money is technically somebody else's money that they've deposited at that bank. Right. And so the money that you're using to uh, finance your education or to uh, uh, buy that house is, again, the money that somebody else is going to be asking uh, 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 asking for when they're trying to get their deposits back from the bank. So, again, if everybody goes and rushes, runs, rushes to the bank at once to get their money back, the bank's not going to have it. Right. But there's a certain amount that they have to keep on hand by law. And those are called required reserves. So required reserves are the minimum amount of reserves that a bank is required to keep on hand in order to back up its deposits, right? So again, there's a certain amount or a certain percentage of your reserves that the bank has to keep on hand in order to back up any deposits in case one person does want all their money back at once, right? So again, the, uh, the dollar amount of uh, reserves that a bank has to keep on hand by law is what is known as required reserves, right? So if a bank is required to keep 20% of deposits on hand and you put $10,000 in the bank, the $2,000 or 20% of that $10,000 are going to be kept there at the bank, right? Either in bulk cash or deposits at the Fed, right? Uh, they have to keep that by law so that you can get your money back if you want it. Now, the last definition we're going to talk about is called the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation 
or FDIC, and this is something that came about as a result of the Great Depression. So this is a federal corporation that insures deposits up to $250,000 per depositor per uh, insured bank. And so to kind of give you a quick history lesson here, one reason why the Great Depression was as bad as it was is because there were known as these bank runs, and that's when everybody tries to get their money back from the bank at once, which as we just talked about, the bank's not going to have it. So again, on October 29th, 1929, you had this major stock market collapse. The economy looked like it was in a bad way. So a lot of people started to try to pull their money out of a bank, right? So imagine that everybody runs the bank A to pull their money out. Well, again, bank A doesn't have everybody's money sitting there at once. So it can't give everybody their money back. And that's when people lose trust in the bank and the bank has to close, right? So now you hear that bank A is closed down and that people who have their deposits at bank A can't get their money back. With that in mind, you have your money in bank B, you're probably thinking the first thing I want to do is run down to bank B and get my money back before bank B closes because if uh, bank B closes and my deposits are still there, then I'm not going to get any money back at all. So you and everybody else who has their money in bank B is going to run to bank B in order to pull their money out all at once. And as uh, we just talked about, bank B is not going to have it, so they're going to shut down as well. Now imagine people who have their money in bank C, they've heard that bank A and now bank B is just closed. They're thinking, well, we need to get our money back as quickly as possible. So now everybody runs down to bank C and then tries to pull their money out at once. And again, the bank's not going to have it and that bank's going to collapse. So it's a ripple effect through the economy of all these banks shutting down as a result of these bank runs. So one way to kind of overcome or solve this problem is a system was developed during the Great Depression called the Federal De Deposit Insurance Corporation that says, look, if you try to pull your money out of a bank and the bank doesn't have it or the bank closes down, then the federal government will insure your deposits up to $250,000 per depositor per insured bank. Now, at the time of the Great Depression, it was only $100,000. Right, but has since moved up to $250,000. And what this does is this gives people kind of a, uh, a reason not to go and pull their money out of the bank when things look bad. Right, people know that they're covered. So it's going to stop this, uh, these uh, runs on the bank. Right, people who have their money in, say, Bank D, right, if they hear about the first three banks closed, they're like, ah, well, I don't need to pull my money out because if the bank closes, then again, I'm insured up to 250 grand in this day and age. Meaning that if you had $200,000 in the bank and the bank closed down, the government would pay you that $200,000 back. Or if you had $250,000 in the bank, then the government would pay you $250,000 back. Now, if you had $250,000 in one dollar in that bank account, then the government would only pay you the $250,000, you'd lose out on that dollar. However, remember that this is uh, deposits up to $250,000 per depositor per insured bank. Which means if you have over $250,000 that you're going to put in a bank, you're just going to move it around to different banks. So you're going to put maybe $250,000 in the Bank of America. And then if you have another, say, $200,000 that you don't want to lose, you might put that in a different bank, maybe a Wells Fargo or BBBA or any other bank out there that is FDIC insured. Also, if you have a joint account, say you and your spouse have an account, a uh, joint account with a bank, then that will be deposited up to uh, $500,000 or $250,000, again, per depositor, right? So if you have two depositors for that account, then again, you'll have uh, $500,000 of insurance uh, for that particular account, right? So that's kind of how this Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation works. It's actually one of the uh, better uh, policies that was enacted during the Great Depression in an effort to uh, stave off these bank runs. However, uh, just like we've talked about with most policies, uh, does, does have some potential secondary effects or some unintended consequences. And one of those is that because people are feeling comfortable having their money in these banks uh, and they're not going to pull all their money out when things start to look bad, then unfortunately banks now have more of a license to make risky investments with that money, knowing that the uh, federal government are going to back up those deposits, which is one reason why people might not have pulled their money out of certain investment banks when that housing market collapse started to hit. Right, as, people, as those uh, investment banks were taking big chances with people's money, investing in um, uh, mortgage-backed securities that were probably less safe than they should invest in. Right, so again, it's not a perfect policy. It has some secondary effects, but it did stop the bleeding at the time of the Great Depression, and we certainly needed that bleeding to stop the most. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about how banks create money, which is kind of an interesting concept that you might not have thought about, but certainly works throughout our economy today. So remember we talked about the required reserves, which is the dollar amount of uh, deposits that the bank has to keep on hand. 
And that is very related to the required reserve ratio, ratio, which is the percentage of deposits that banks are required to hold as reserves. So again, if you put $10,000 in Bank of America, if the required reserve ratio is 20%, then the required reserves is 20% of that 10,000 or $2,000 that the bank has to hold. If you were to put $100,000 in Bank of America, then they have to hold, again, 20% of that 100,000. Uh, so uh, that would be $20,000 in required reserves based off that required reserve ratio of 20%. Now, banks are allowed to hold on to more than that if they wish. These are called excess reserves, and these are any reserves that exceed the legal requirement. Having said that, it is usually in the bank's uh, best interest or incentive to uh, loan out as much money as they can all the way down to those requ that required reserve ratio because any amount that they are holding on to that they are not loaning out is money that they are not earning a profit on. Right? Remember, the bank charges you a uh, or gives you a lower interest rate than what they are charging people who are borrowing money. So the more money they can loan out, then the more profit that bank will make. That's why there's a limit to how um, uh, much they can lend out, and there's a requirement for how much they have to hold on to. But they are allowed to hold on to more than that if they wish, and there are certain times where they might feel the need to do so. Right. But with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about banks create money. We're going to go through a scenario here or a picture. I want you to imagine a required reserve ratio, which I'm just going to abbreviate as RRR, equal to 20%. So banks have to hold on to 20% of uh, any uh, deposits at that particular bank. Now, let's say that the Federal Reserve System or the Fed decides to increase money supply by $1,000. So the Fed uses some expansionary monetary policy, which we're going to talk about at the end of this chapter, right, to increase money supply. by $1,000, right? So that $1,000 might end up in, say, a bank. We'll call it Bank A. So here's our bank. If you ever notice, banks have, like, really nice, like, marble columns and things like that. So there's, here's the marble columns for the bank. And again, we'll call this Bank A. By the way, if you want to know why banks didn't have, like, really nice, like, uh, marble floors and marble columns and stuff like that and nice furniture when nobody really cares about that or spends any time in the bank, it's to send a signal to you that the bank's not going to run off with your money. They're saying, hey, look, look at all this time and effort we spent designing this building and putting in this nice furniture. We're not a fly-by-night organization that is going to run off with your money. If you see a bank that's just like a rickety old shack or like a cardboard sign on, some, on the trunk of somebody's car, don't put your money in that bank. That somebody's probably going to leave with it. That's not somebody not to be trusted with all that money you're about to hand them. Well, let's say, again, this is a nice, trustworthy bank, like a Bank of America or something like that, or BB&T, uh, and, uh, again, you, they have $1,000 more dollars into this bank. Well, with that $1,000, again, they are required by law to hold on to 20% uh, of it, so they're going to hold on to $200. Now, that means that they can loan out a difference of $800. So that's $800 that they might loan to, say, you who is using that money for your college education. So now you've got this $800 that you're going to go spend on, say, textbooks or blue books or whatever it is that college students are buying, right? And wherever you spend that money, people who get that money, they're going to put it in a different bank, right? Let's say through a bunch of various channels, right? So the person who runs the bookstore, the person who's selling you blue books, or the person who's selling you weed or beer or whatever it is you're doing that money, right? Let's say that all those people put their money into Bank B. So here's Bank B, also very fancy with its columns and nice furniture and all that stuff. They now have $800 more than they had before, right? Now, again, they are required by law, the $800 ends up, their, ends up in their bank, to hold on to 20% of that $800. So they're going to hold on to $160, and this allows them to loan out $640, right? So again, they're going to loan out $640 to another individual, maybe somebody who wants to use that money to uh, buy a house or um, start a business, right? So now this person has $640 that they're then going to pay or say materials for their business or for their house or whatever, 
right? Uh, whatever they spend that $640 on, again, it might not be uh, just one transaction, but through a series of transactions, let's say this money ends up into bank C. Again, with their marble columns and nice furniture and everything like that. So there's bank C. Now bank C has to, by law, hold on to 20% of this $640, and then they can loan out the rest. So they're not allowed to loan out uh, everything. Again, they have to hold on to that 20%, which comes out to be $128. And then they can loan out the other uh, $512, which then goes to the next individual, and so forth and so on. And this keeps on going until there's no uh, more dollars to loan out. Right, so with that in mind, here's what I want you to uh, take note of, is that Bank A, when somebody put $1,000 into Bank A, $1,000 is what is in Bank A's deposits. So they have $1,000 on their books that was injected into the economy by the Federal Reserve. So in other words, when the Federal Reserve put this $1,000 into Bank A, now in the Bank A's computer, there is $1,000 there. Now, there's not really $1,000 there because they only held 200 of it, and then they loaned out 800 Now, $800 ended up in Bank B. So in Bank B's computer, there is $800 there, right? So there's now $1,000 in Bank A's computer and $800 in Bank B's computer, all from that original $1,000. Now, again, Bank B doesn't really have $800 there because they're going to loan out $640 that's going to end up in Bank C. So Bank C now has $640 into their computer, right? Having said that, again, they don't necessarily have $640 there because they've loaned out $512 and so forth and so on. So you're going to add the $1,000 from Bank A to the $800 from Bank B to the $640 from Bank C and so forth and so on. And that's how much the actual money supply is going to be increased just by that simple injection of $1,000 into the uh, uh, economy. Right, so that's kind of how banks are creating money on their computers that doesn't necessarily really exist in terms of the actual dollars that are floating out, uh, around out there. And that's what happens with fractional reserve banking. And again, it's a system that, uh, this isn't necessarily a scandalous thing, it's a system that the economy has come to rely on. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about what this means in terms of this potential deposit expansion, or often known as the money multiplier. So the potential deposit expansion multiplier or the money multiplier is the maximum potential increase in the money supply as a ratio of new reserves injected into the banking system. Basically what happens is a little bit of money can turn into a lot of money through this multiplying process. So it's kind of similar to that uh, spending or expenditure multiplier that we talked about back in chapter 11, right? Except that now it's happening through an increase in the money supply rather than necessarily an increase in spending. Now the money multiplier is the inverse of the required reserve ratio. The larger the required reserve ratio, the smaller the multiplier is going to be. So our money multiplier, which is abbreviated as MM here, is going to be equal to 1 over that required reserve ratio. Right. So the bigger that required reserve ratio, or the bigger the denominator, the smaller that money multiplier is going to be. Right. The lower the required reserve ratio, or the smaller the denominator, the bigger the bigger that money multiplier is going to be. Right. So with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and exit the full screen so we can go back to this example. So in this case, we have a required reserve ratio of 0 0.20. So our money multiplier here is going to be equal to one over that required reserve ratio, or it's going to be equal to 1 over 0 0.20. And that's going to be equal to 5. And what that means is that that $1,000 that was originally injected into the uh, money supply could create as much as $5,000 increase in the money supply if everybody is um, um, putting this money in banks and banks are extending out the full amount which they are allowed to extend out or they're not holding on to any excess reserves, right? So again, if this required reserve ratio were to say uh, go up, right? Let's say the required reserve ratio would increase from um, uh, 0.20 to 0.50, right? If we were to have that kind of change, then look what would happen to the money multiplier it would go down to two, which means that that same $1,000 
would we only create $2,000 worth of increase in money supply, right? And think about why that's the case. Because now Bank A, under this new rules, has to hold on to $500, right? That means that they can only loan out $500. So that's only $500 that this person can then spend. And that's only $500 that's going to end up in Bank B. Bank B has to hold on to half of that. So that's like $250, which means that's another $250 that they can loan out, right? So that's only $250 that this person now gets. That's only $250 that's going to end up in Bank C, right? So it drastically cuts down the amount that can be loaned out and end up into other banks when that required reserve ratio is higher. So this is one way that the Fed can control the money supply is by controlling the required reserve ratio. If they want to use restrictive monetary policy and decrease the money supply, then they're going to increase that required reserve ratio. Having said that, if they want to use expansionary monetary policy and increase the money supply, then they might lower that required reserve ratio, right? Imagine that that required reserve ratio was just 10% so that banks could loan out 90% of their uh, uh, deposits. In that case, the multiplier is going to be equal to 10, right? Which means that that $1,000 will create an additional $10,000 in money supply. Right? So again, the smaller the required reserve ratio, then the bigger the uh, money multiplier and the more money that's going to be created. Right? So keep that in mind because that's going to be one of the ways that the Fed conducts monetary policy. And that is what we're going to be talking about uh, at the end of this particular chapter. So with that in mind, let us uh, go ahead and do an a, a example of a question that you may see on the uh, quiz or exam. And it says, if there's a required reserve, uh, uh, a reserve requirement of 5%, this implies a potential deposit expansion multiplier of, again, that potential deposit expansion multiplier could be called the money multiplier for short, because potential deposit expansion multiplier is certainly a mouthful. All right, so again, this is just asking you to do that simple calculation where the money multiplier is equal to 1 over the required reserve ratio, or in this case, 1 over 0 0.05, which is equal to 20. So if the Fed were to inject $1,000 into our money supply, it could create as much as $20,000 as a result of this uh, potential deposit expansion multiplier. Right? So again, be able to answer a question like that on the, uh, on the quiz or exam. So the last thing we're going to cover in this video is the actual deposit multiplier. Right? So new currency reserves will not necessarily expand the money supply by as much as that potential uh, multiplier indicates for two reasons. In other words, uh, if the required reserve ratio is 20%, then again, that money multiplier is going to be equal to uh, 5. So that $1,000 could increase the money supply by as much as $5,000. But it might not necessarily increase the money supply by as much as $5,000 for uh, one or a uh, combination of these two reasons. Right, so the effect of this potential deposit expansion multiplier could be reduced if, one, some people decide to hold currency rather than deposit it in the bank. So in other words, if people don't put money in the bank, but say keep it in their walls or bury it in the ground or keep it in their wallets, then that's going to limit the amount of money that the banks can uh, multiply. Or if the banks fail to use all their new uh, excess reserves to extend loans, meaning that they're holding on to excess reserves or not loaning out as much as they possibly could. Right. So again, if banks are holding excess reserves up and above the legal requirement, then that's going to reduce the size of the multiplier. Right. So again, there's a difference between the potential deposit expansion multiplier, which is the most that that money supply uh, that, that, that it's the most that that increase in money supply could create versus the actual deposit multiplier, which is how much actually gets created as a result of that increase in money supply. Right. I'm not going to go over uh, any equations for the actual deposit multiplier in this particular class although you will have to learn them if you take intermediate macroeconomics. Uh, but for now, just know that, again, that potential deposit expansion multiplier might not be as big as uh, it could be uh, for these two reasons. Again, the more money that people hold in their wallets or in their homes versus in the banks, or the uh, more money that the banks hold on to in terms of excess reserves, right? then the smaller that the multiplier effect will be. All right. So that is it for uh, part one here of this chapter. When you come back for part two, we're going to be talking about the Federal Reserve System and how that operates and then how they conduct monetary policy. All right? If you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email or come visit me during those Zoom office hours. And as always, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. But until then, just let me know uh, if you need anything and take care.